great to be here with you. It's been a few years um, since we've been able to be together in person, but you are my favorite group to speak to because I think we have a lot of common cause. I mean, I could talk about conspiracy theories with you, and I think we're going to view them mostly the same way. Right? These are dubious ideas. We should be uh, very careful before we adopt them and certainly before we act on them. So if I was to come out and say that to you, I think I would be preaching to the choir, and I didn't want to do that. Uh, today. I figured it might be more interesting if I uh, maybe made a few arguments that might contradict some of the priors uh, that we have out here, particularly priors about conspiracy theories that have developed over the last few years. So we have been hearing a lot about conspiracy theories lately. So these are just the number of articles each year in the New York Times with the word conspiracy theory in it. In 2010, it was about 100 articles that year. By 2020, it was almost 800 articles featuring conspiracy theory. So journalists are talking a lot about this topic. As I like to say, the downfall of the republic is sort of a boon for my career, um, but that's not particularly comforting for most people. So when they're reporting on conspiracy theories, what is it that journalists are talking about? So if you follow the coverage, it's conspiracy theories are on the rise. From the Congo to the Capitol, conspiracy theories are surging everywhere. And right now we're living in the golden age of conspiracy theories, so that's, that's not good. The Washington Post is concerned that you might fall down the conspiracy theory rabbit hole. And yes, this is the Washington Post and not Cosmo, but nonetheless, you can take the quiz and find out. I shouldn't make fun of them, I wrote the quiz, so that's sort of... Partially my fault. <laughs> so when they're doing this coverage, um, what are the consequences of this apparent rise in conspiracy theorizing? Well, QAnon is driving people to not wear masks and to not get vaccinated. Some people believe in conspiracy theories are even committing terrible, terrible violence. One person killed their spouse. Another person killed their children. So none of that is, is good. So who's to blame for all of this? If you read the coverage, who is getting blamed? Well, social media. So TikTok is great for spreading conspiracy theories. YouTube unleashed the conspiracy theory boom. The pandemic video is going all across social media and convincing everyone. And the internet is loosening our grip on truth. So I, I guess social media is behind it. And when I said find a villain, um, I really meant it. So Zuckerberg, the modern Bond villain, is now coming for your children. So it's a very strong coverage of this. Even the president has gotten in on this narrative saying social media platforms are killing people and we need to do something about it. The public is largely convinced of this narrative. 70% of Americans, when asked, believe that conspiracy theories are currently out of control. 60% of Americans believe that we believe conspiracy theories more than we did 25 years ago, and the vast majority of Americans blame social media for this state of affairs. I mean, there are, of course, really good reasons to be concerned. I mean, conspiracy theories are dubious beliefs. They're usually very poorly evidenced. They can lead to greater forms of distrust, and they are often associated with very dangerous and deleterious actions. So good enough reason to care. But before we do anything about it, we really have to think about what are the policy implications of doing something about conspiracy theories. So if we start regulating technology to sort of stop their spread on social media, that would likely decrease innovation. If we are to regulate our online markets, that would probably decrease choice and increase prices. I mean, just to give you an example of this, when Mark Zuckerberg was in front of the Senate a few years ago, Lindsey Graham asked him, if we were to write legislation, will you help us write it? Zuckerberg said, of course. Two years later, he showed up at the Senate with the bill that they had written, hoping the Senate would pass it. And of course, that bill would have, would have greatly favored Facebook's market position over any other uh, entrant into the market. But more importantly than any of that is that we're, we're talking about the regulation of speech. And we always have to be very careful um, when we start talking about saying what we can and can't say online. Because first, any sort of regulation on this would lead to a chilling effect. 
Second, there are people in this room who have had things taken down off their social media by the platforms because even though they were debunking a conspiracy theory, the algorithms can't always tell the difference between that and propagating a conspiracy theory. And even worse than that is that if you give the power of censorship to the government, they are going to define misinformation and conspiracy as things that accuse them, right? And that's not something that we should allow. So very quickly, why do people believe conspiracy theories? I think the simplest answer that I like to give is this. For the same reason people adopt all their other beliefs. And that's something like this, a combination of largely stable factors that they have inside of them, their dispositions, their group attachments and identities, and their personality traits. So who we are very much determines what it is that we believe. So if we think about a very simple model of belief adoption, it looks something like this. Information comes in, it gets laid over our dispositions, our worldviews, our identities, and our traits, and that leads us to adopt a specific belief about it. Meaning that if you have two different people, they can look at the exact same piece of information and come to very different conclusions about it. Now this gets even more complicated once we realize that who we are also determines what information we seek out, right? So it's not always that easy to convince people of things. People aren't always easily persuadable. So again, the popular narrative that we've been seeing for the last few years is something like this. Social media use is leading to increases in conspiracy theory beliefs, which is then leading to increases in non-normative behaviors. So the expectation then is that if I were to poll on a whole bunch of conspiracy theories today, the numbers that I get should be higher than at any time in the past. We should expect all sorts of noticeable and measurable increases. So let's, let's think about if that's true. So the first example I want to give is that of JFK conspiracy theory. So only a few weeks after the assassination in 1963, Gallup did a nationwide poll where they asked Americans, was the president killed by a conspiracy or by a lone gunman? Even then, it was 55-0% that believed it was a conspiracy rather than a lone gunman. By 1975, this had increased to 80% believing that it was a conspiracy. This number's only come down in the last few decades during the internet and social media eras. And what this tells us is that not all conspiracy theories are increasing due to internet and social media, and also that you don't need the internet and social media for a conspiracy theory to be widely believed. So let's look at a critical case, which is COVID. I had a poll going out in early March 2020, and that's right when the pandemic started to hit. So I said, oh, let's get some conspiracy theories on there. So I was able to squeeze two in, which sort of covered the contours of, of conspiracy theorizing about COVID, particularly at the beginning of the pandemic. And the first was that it was being exaggerated to hurt Trump in the election year. And the other was that it was sort of a bioweapon, intentionally created and intentionally released in order to harm people. So in March 2020, both came in around 30% of Americans agreeing or strongly agreeing that those ideas were true. But we repolled them again in June of 2020, October of 2020, and for the bioweapon belief in May of 2021. We found no increases over time in either of them. And this is the time frame in which it seems like there was the most misinformation and even the pandemic video was running rampant on social media. In June of 2020, we started polling a whole lot of other ideas that had popped up at that time. But what we found was that whether we were talking about uh, the pandemic being used to force vaccines on people, that Bill Gates was behind the pandemic, that we're going to get tracking devices injected into our necks, that hydroxy worked, that 5G was spreading it, or that you could spray yourself with disinfectant and cure your COVID, none of those went up between June 2020 and a year later. They either went down or stayed stagnant. So how about another critical case? How about QAnon? We heard quite a bit about QAnon during 2020 and 2021, with most of the coverage saying this is big and it's getting bigger, watch out. 
So I had started polling on QAnon in 2018, and I ran a poll in Florida because that's where we seemed to see it pop up at a Trump rally there a few years ago. So I gave survey respondents a feeling thermometer, which ran from zero to 100, where if they said it's 100, that meant they really liked it, and if it was zero, that meant they really hated it. So we asked respondents what they thought about the QAnon movement. And the average that we got from Floridians was 24 out of 100, so no stunning endorsement. And just to put that into perspective, we also put Fidel Castro on the feeling thermometer too. If you know anything about Florida, you know we don't like Castro much. We danced in the streets when he died. Um, and he came in only a few points different than QAnon. So again, no endorsement of QAnon. Um, we, re we did this both nationwide and in Florida over and over again in the last few years, and we never found increases. If anything, we found decreases in feelings toward QAnon over time. If you just ask a straight up question, so in, 19, in, in 2019, um, are you a believer in QAnon, yes or no? 5% of Americans said yes. In 2021, we repeated the same question um, and got 6%, so not an increase statistically speaking. Um, and just to put those numbers in perspective, the yellow bar there is belief in JFK conspiracy theories, which is almost 10 times as widespread as, as QAnon was at that time. Now the red and blue bars are when we divide the sample up into Republicans and Democrats. One of the narratives about QAnon was that this is a far right conspiracy theory. What we found in both these polls and many others was that if you're just measuring straight up belief or support for QAnon, partisanship and ideology don't really predict beliefs in it. So again, uh, they believed it about the same from left and right. And there's a reason for this. QAnon beliefs tend to be driven not by conservatism or by liberalism, but a lot more by just hating the system as a whole and wanting to blow it up. So beyond those critical cases, um, I went back to survey, the survey archives and said, let's get all the conspiracy theories that have been asked over the last several decades, re-poll them the exact same way with national samples and see if there's been increases. So I was able to put together 37 conspiracy theories that had been polled on before um, so that the time range ran between 60 years and one year. And what we found was out of the 37 conspiracy theories that I re-polled, only six had increased over time. 16 showed no change and 15 decreased over time, with the average across the 37 was about a negative three-point decrease over time. So again, not strong evidence that conspiracy theory beliefs were going up, and none of the ones that were going up were ones that journalists were talking about. If we wanted to put aside uh, specific conspiracy theory beliefs and say maybe it's not specific conspiracy theories that are driving this. Uh, maybe it's just that people are becoming more conspiratorial in their worldview and that's what's going on. Well, I've been measuring that too since 2012 with a four item measure that sort of gets under the hood and it measures what I call underlying conspiracy thinking. And since 2012 to 2021, the line has been flat and we've measured it many, many times and again, that's not going up either. So returning to the narrative, social media use leading to increases in conspiracy theories, leading to non-normative behavior, well, we're not getting um, that middle box there. So for social media, oftentimes the narrative is something like this. People go on social media, they get exposed to all sorts of conspiracy theories and misinformation, then they just blindly believe it, and then they become like this. That's not good. And it's absolutely true that in all the studies I've seen that social media use is strongly correlated with the number of conspiracy theories that people believe. So that the more social media people use, the more conspiracy theories that, that, that they are engaging with. Um, and oftentimes it's taken as evidence of a media effect, whereas people are being exposed and that's persuading them to adopt these ideas that they wouldn't otherwise have. Well, it's important to understand that correlation is not causation, and what seems to be going on is that people are self-selecting into their online environments, people are seeking out conspiracy theories because those theories match what they already believe about the world, 
And when people are incidentally exposed, oftentimes they can reason away things that they don't already agree with, right? So if someone isn't already inclined towards conspiracy theorizing, they're not gonna seek that stuff out, and if they are exposed, they're not likely gonna buy in because it's just not gonna match who they are. So what about non-normative behaviors? And we've seen a lot of that lately, people not wearing masks, not getting vaccinated. We've seen many instances of violence and even treason that are closely uh, associated with conspiracy theories. Well, the first thing to understand is that behaviors are really hard to predict. Lots and lots of people believe that the election was fraudulent. Uh, many people believe in QAnon, but most of the people with those beliefs were either at home or at work on January 6, 2021. Only a very small portion actually showed up to attack the Capitol. So most of these people that hold these sorts of beliefs aren't always acting on them in deleterious ways. And it's important to understand that people's views, their worldviews, their predispositions, their personality traits are in place long before they're exposed to conspiracy theories and long before they might believe in them. So one way to think about this is that antisocial people are seeking out and adopting antisocial ideas, and then they're acting in antisocial ways because they are antisocial people. So the correlation between the beliefs and the behaviors is effectively zero because both are being driven by who they are. So some recent examples, um, there was a woman early on in the pandemic who trashed a mask aisle at Target because she was following QAnon. Uh, man, uh, killed his children with a spear gun. He was believing in lizard people and QAnon conspiracy theories. This person pictured here, who was a QAnon believer, killed a mafia boss. And, of course, there were people who attacked the Capitol on January 6th. If you dig into each of these cases, what you find is that for the top three, they all had lots of dispositions and traits and psychopathologies that led them to these behaviors perhaps more so than just the beliefs. And for the people attacking the Capitol, I mean, there were many days that QAnon gave for when they were gonna go back and take over the Capitol building. But none of them really materialized except for January 6th. And why was that? Because you had the President of the United States saying, be here at this time to do this thing, now go get them. So oftentimes you have to have a lot of things in place to turn those beliefs into any sort of action. So generally, the way I think about social media now is that you've got a bunch of people like this who then go online, and they're still like that. It's just you can see it a lot easier. So, you know, I, I, like many people, when the pandemic hit, I was very, very concerned about the conspiracy theorizing and the misinformation, and it's appropriate to be concerned. But I think as time goes, has gone on and researchers have gone back and started looking at the data, um, we've become a little bit less alarmist in some of, our, some of our conclusions. So, you know, the Russian misinformation didn't do that much to affect the 2016 outcome. Um, echo chambers don't seem to be that big in affecting that many people. The algorithms don't seem to do that much in terms of recommending more extreme content to people. Oftentimes what we're finding is that people are just self-selecting into stuff that matches who they are already. People's exposure to fake news, um, they tend to see some of it, but not all that much in comparison to the real news that they see online. Exposure isn't always needed to adopt beliefs in misinformation and conspiracy theories. People can just believe wrong stuff on their own. And oftentimes people use conspiracy theories as rationalizations for things that they would do anyway. So why the disjuncture between the media headlines and what the scholarship is saying now? Well, the mainstream media is in competition with social media, so we should sort of expect that they're, that they're gonna give negative headlines about their competitors. Journalists tend to assume that people are very persuadable. Um, in that whenever they see something, whether it's online um, or elsewhere, they'll be easily convinced, but that's just not very true. There's been a long line of tech panics in this country. If you go back 120 years, people were concerned about novel reading. Then it was jazz music, then radio, then TV, then this, then that, and now it's social media. 
There's also been a lack of focus on people and their agency. Like conspiracy theorists, I think it's very easy for us to blame some outside force for what's going on. Like, I don't want to blame my family members for their conspiracy beliefs. It would be great if I could blame some other thing. Zuckerberg did it to them. And that's an easy story to tell ourselves, but it's not necessarily a true one. And finally, negative, fantastic headlines tend to attract audiences. So you say, now is the time of conspiracy theory. That's going to get a lot more clicks than, hey, things are just sort of the same as they were last week. That's boring. So even if you look at the reasoning that journalists give for why we are now in the golden age of conspiracy theory, they're sort of all over the place and they're very contradictory. So 9-11 ushered in the new era of conspiracy theories. And these are all recent, by the way. Sandy Hook ushered in the new era of conspiracy theories. No, wait, it was the Parkland shooting that did it. No, it was the pandemic that did it. So everything is sort of giving us the new era of conspiracy theories according to the news coverage. And if you go back to the newspaper databases and start looking for all the claims they've made in the past, you'll find that 2018 was a highly conspiratorial year according to Vox. 2017, this was the year of conspiracy theories. 2013, New York Times said we are now a conspiracy nation. 2011, conspiracy theories have never lodged this deeply in the American psyche. 2010, it's now a period of fashionable conspiracism. 2004, it's now the golden age of conspiracy theory. 1994, it's the dawn of a new age of conspiracy theory according to the Washington Post. Of course, that's a correction because only three years earlier they said we were now in the age of conspiracy theory then. 1977, we're as conspiracy prone as the pan-slav nationalists from the 1880s. I don't even know what that means. I guess it's bad. Um, and 1964, conspiracy theories have grown weed-like here and abroad. So we're always at the apex of conspiracy theorizing. We're always about to fall off the conspiracy cliff. But it can always be true. So I guess that leads to a sort of uncomfortable question, and that is when should we listen to journalists? Listen, journalists are drafting uh, you know, rough drafts of history, and they're doing it on very tight deadlines. So they're not going to get everything right all the time, and that's fine. So when should we believe them? When they have evidence for their claims, and when they can back up claims like this with something, uh, then we should give it more credence. So I'm going to leave you with good and bad news. Um, the good news is that in terms of the public's beliefs in conspiracy theories, things aren't getting worse. The bad news is, first, that things have always been this bad, <laughs> which, is not, which is not good. Um, at the same time, um, right now what we have are elites, particularly on one side, the right, who are activating people into politics. They are using conspiracy theories to build coalitions, and this is having severe and deleterious consequences on our politics. And if anything, this is what January 6th should tell us, is that for the past seven years now, politicians have been engaging in more and more conspiracy rhetoric, and that has activated people who already share these views into our politics people who don't believe um, in the sanctity of our elections, um, people who are anti-vax, people who hold numerous other beliefs. And what this has done is bring into our politics people who have a whole lot of other baggage with them. Just recently, we have seen an uptick in armed anti-gay and anti-trans demonstrations across the country, just in the last six or seven months. Perhaps one of the reasons for that is, is the fact that our political elites and many of our elites in the media, particularly on the conservative side, are engaging in what I would call a new satanic panic, where they are attacking gay and trans people and essentially saying that they have a secret agenda, that public school teachers are trying to turn kids gay, um, and that uh, they're doing all sorts of terrible things to children, the worst sorts of things imaginable. This is having an effect right now. I don't know if it's convincing anyone of anything they didn't already believe, 
but it's certainly ginning people up, and we're seeing the effects of that. So, if anything, I hope that what comes out of this is that we have a recognition that one, we gotta put the causal arrows in the right place and we gotta know what the data is because we gotta figure out how to solve these problems. Um, but when we leave here, we have to do this together because these problems are still really bad. Um, and I wish I could leave you on a better note. <laughs> I'll be signing books. Um, <laughs> I guess that's it. So, SciCon, thank you very much.